Um, I'm Tom Prislak, the CEO at Cedar sinai by the way. Um, just wanted to make that introduction and express my own personal and Cedar sinais great interest in being a part of this today. Um, it's among the ways that we're trying to make our own contribution to, to advancing this issue. So um, I am executive director of the CSU Institute for Palliative Care, which was founded in 2012 specifically to address workfo workforce issues in palliative care. Um, in part to make sure, in fact, entirely to make sure that everyone at the bedside of a Karen or a Michael knows what they're doing um, and has the skills and has the training because we have to have the skilled clinicians in order to do the work. Uh, we're also providing a lot of training across the state in support of uh, SB 1004 with DHCS um, and working on a pediatric palliative care curriculum, just FYI. So, Palliative care, uh, arguably, is the most important sector uh, to address serious illness across the state, but it only became a subspecialty in 2006, so it's been scrambling to catch up. Just talking about the physician uh, area, there are only about 5,000 hosp certified hospice and palliative medicine physicians currently practicing. There are fewer than 120 fellowship or training programs uh, that are available for them. And the shortage of hospice and palliative medicine physicians uh, has been estimated to be between about 6,000 and 18,000, just to meet the current need. So if you think about each of these little characters as being representing 10 people, um, for every one cardiologist, there are about 70 heart patients. For every one hospice and palliative uh, physician, there are about 1,700 patients living with life-threatening illness and 20,000 who are living with a serious or chronic condition. The uh, chart on the other side there will show you that the number of doctors over time is estimated to stay fairly static. In fact, it's likely to go down before it goes up, and even while the need uh, is, is uh, accelerating. Just in California, uh, I took these uh, figures from a study by AHPM that was looking at uh, the, the, the workforce issues. This represents the number of hospice and palliative medicine physicians per 100,000 population in just a handful of our California cities. Even with that, we're actually doing pretty well in terms of the availability of palliative care. Um, in California, we have uh, up to 80% of our hospitals have some kind of palliative care service, although just what that is and how extensive it is varies a lot. Uh, in context of another of a consulting project that I did a couple years ago, we looked at the Catholic hospitals across the state very closely. 100% of them have palliative care. 85% have some sort of a designated team of palliative care uh, clinicians, but sometimes that's physician, nurse, or nurse social worker, or in one case even nurse, uh, sorry, uh, social worker chaplain. Only 8% of them have all members of the team, and 49% of them are looking to hire. So we definitely have a workforce shortage. The numbers are harder to come by, and for the other members of the team, nurse practitioners, social workers, chaplains, all have certification programs that are available to them, um, but it's harder to measure the actual workforce issues. We do know that there are fewer than 10 fellowships for nurse practitioners in palliative care across the country. Education, in my view, has to extend beyond initial training, obviously. We, we need fellowships, we need better curriculum in medical and nursing schools and social work schools, but we also need lifelong learning, and that's where we're doing our part. I'm sharing this with you not just to toot our own horn, but just to give you a sense of how a little investment can go a very long way. So with our very itty bitty staff of 20 people and a few instructors and uh, subject matter experts and 300 healthcare organizations that we're working with closely, several of them are here today, we have trained about 8,600 healthcare, currently working healthcare professionals over the past several years. Given that the average palliative care consult team in, a, in an inpatient setting does about 1,000 consults a year, we figure that we have made the lives and deaths better for 8.6 million people just in, with a little bit of training. Actually, it's pretty extensive training. But education is a big part of this. Um, the clinicians have to know what they're doing, and they have to have the skills. So we're working on the workforce, uh, but 
we have a long way to go. Good morning. My name is Shelley Garoni. I'm an internist and a palliative care physician. I've been a palliative care physician at least since the early 2000s. Uh, I actually joke that I was the original black cloud. So I've been a palliative care physician since I was a medical student and didn't realize at the time what that was. I'm honored to be here this morning with you, and I'm honored to represent Kaiser Permanente. If you're not aware about Kaiser Permanente, we are a national company. We are in eight states. In California, in Northern California, we have 22 medical centers and 22 hospitals, 10,000 physicians, and 100,000 staff. In Sacramento, we have three hospitals, South Sacramento, Sacramento, and Roseville. We are currently at just under 1 million members and just under 2,000 providers. Uh, we have a palliative care service in Sacramento, Roseville, so I t joke that my job is rather schizophrenic and I'm based out of the trunk of my car. I go to between two hospitals. We started formally in 2002 with three FTEs. We are now 20 FTEs strong and that is five and a half physicians and then many nurses, social workers, chaplains, administrative support. Our palliative care team is seeing inpatients and between the two hospitals average daily census is 45 to 55 patients. I do nursing home consults. Uh, I actually started that because we have a fellowship and I needed a job for the fellows so I called a nursing home doc and said, hey, can I throw a fellow out in the field with you? It turned out to be a good thing. We're still trying to formalize what the, the nursing home work looks like. We staff our emergency department Monday through Friday with a palliative care physician as well, and we are in clinic uh, three days a week. I'm Daniela Meeker. I'm an assistant professor at, at the, as you heard, at, at USC, and I work with many other uh, people in the Schaefer Center for Health Policy and Economics on trying to solve wicked problems, as we heard earlier, trying to get a sense of how we can put all of this uh, data, dispersed data, and uh, information that is not necessarily connected together into something that might become evidence-based practice and hopefully evidence-based policy in conjunction with advocates and people that are really working to turn evidence into things that are happening on the ground. Um, the topic of this part of the panel, looking at whether California will be ready, is of particular interest to many of us that are really trying to figure out how to advance all of this into something that will make a difference in people's lives. And we have seen today so many uh, occasions where there's a lot of things that are the sort of gold of health economists, which is a natural experiment. Usually you can't do an experiment in healthcare. And what's happening in California right now is that we have dozens if not hundreds of different changes that are happening on the ground, on the front lines, and then at the policy level that we are not necessarily prepared to take advantage of by turning all of the context that that's around from the data, from the data standpoint, which is diffuse into information and then evidence. And I think that it should be something that we all try to advocate for together is to try to bring the groups of people that are working so hard together on the front lines and in developing their own programs to the point where they can collaborate in a way that protects patient privacy but also takes into account patient interests. And there's a lot of different uh, verticals that haven't really been put together that could be made to integrate the patient perspective with the provider perspective, with the institutional perspective, and then ultimately with the kind of administrative data if we can work together. And I really see some opportunities emerging in small situations like this that we could collaborate more effectively. Hi, I'm Tori Fields. I'm the Senior Manager for Advanced Illness and Palliative Care at Blue Shield of California, as well as our affiliated managed Medicaid plan, so our Medi-Cal plan, uh, Care First Health Plan. Um, we directly contract with over 70,000 providers in the state of California. Um, we actually cover through our commercial and Medicare Advantage plans um, a little over 4 million lives um, and uh, half a million more with our Medicaid plan. Um, we at Blue Shield, um, our mission is really to provide um, all ensure that all Californians have access to high quality care at an affordable price. We see uh, palliative care as a critical component to allowing access to high quality care for people who are facing serious illness um, and provides and improves informed consent and shared decision making for all of our members. Um, and really have spent some time in advanced care planning and looking at how we provide um, 
care across the continuum, even before the point of a diagnosis of serious illness. Um, we see palliative care as uh, something that should be a standard service uh, for all of our members. So in um, 2015, we uh, had a directive that we would get out of pilot mode. We knew um, through our partnership with California Healthcare Foundation and a lot of the investment in payer provider partnerships in this space um, that there was a business case for palliative care. We just needed to figure out how to make this accessible to everyone. Um, we know that palliative care can be provided across a variety of settings and should be provided starting at point, point of diagnosis of a serious illness. And because of that, we've used a multi-pronged approach to increasing access to palliative care and uh, serious illness communication competencies and training, knowing that at some point we are going to max out all of our palliative care specialists. Um, that multi-pronged approach uh, includes community partnerships to promote advanced care planning, investments in inpatient palliative care. As you heard Jennifer say, we don't have a lot of inpatient units who have um, full teams, and we want to support that. We invest in high-risk clinics with our accountable care organizations. Um, we also, uh, starting in 2017, rolled out statewide uh, the provision of home-based palliative care, uh, which is provided through an interdisciplinary team um, that are all reimbursed on a per member, per month uh, basis, uh, bundled payment basis. This is accessible as a standard service, uh, available to all of our members who are eligible, and we cover the entire state, supporting over 50 direct contracts with community-based palliative care providers, all at really different levels of capacity and understanding of how to work with a health plan. Um, we are also piloting de the delivery of social services, um, so meal delivery, transportation, and respite care in some of our commercial plans, and are actually excited about the extension of doing that um, through our Medicare Advantage plans um, through the, um, the rule change and the supplemental benefits. We've found that despite changing payment models, few individuals are actually accessing palliative care. Uh, and so we uh, really look to increasing knowledge and the culture and awareness of these services and what they mean to patients and families, um, both through direct media channels um, and through the training of providers in this space. Let me ask um, each of you have addressed the question from your respective um, uh, positions. Um, maybe ask each of you to um, comment a little on um, uh, examples of success that you've seen so far. Some of, what, some of those have been mentioned, so maybe go a little deeper on those. Um, but also, um, what are the biggest barriers that you see to advance the particular aspect of this that, that each of you are focused on? Well, certainly in the, in the area of training and education, um, I will be forgiven for thinking that our organization has had a big impact on that and has been very successful. Uh, we're certainly not the only one. Uh, there are a number of universities that are entering this space with master's programs or certificate programs in palliative care, um, and several of the uh, professional organizations, CAPSI, AHPM, NHPCO, et cetera, are um, also uh, doing their best to train. I think the, the availability of high quality training programs is less of a barrier than the funding to provide it. Um, we have noticed that a number of organizations that we're working with, um, and I'll, I'll uh, particularly give a shout out to Aspire, uh, are very willing to either offset or entirely pay for education for nurses, uh, but less so for social workers, less so for chaplains. Um, and these are all members, critically important members of the team and often are carrying a big load for the team. Uh, so that's, that, that's a concern as well then uh, just you know, being able to slot into a palliative care service when the reimbursement again for members of the team other than physicians and nurses is, is so low. It, it may be a career challenge for, for some of these folks despite the fact that, that everyone is, is badly needed. 
So I think you know, all of this kind of wraps around itself. You know, the reimbursement is a problem with the services. It's also a problem with the training. And if you don't have, have highly trained people to do the work, th this is hard work, and it's very specialized work. It's not, it's not a skill that you can just sort of tack on you know, to you know, something that, that you've already done. Um, licensure so often can be a barrier to optimizing both the available, the available workforce and making the, the broadest use of it. Uh, is licensure a significant issue in addressing the workforce question? I, I guess I would ask each of you. Not really. I mean, you know, I think you know, licensure is, is, is a, is a state-level designation that you're allowed to practice. Mm -hmm. you know, credentialing is something a, a little bit better. Certification is something a little bit better. We did hear that one of the, one of the recommendations of the, of the uh, Dying in America report was to, to have requirements built into benefits that the clinicians be certified, and, and, and that's great. And we would certainly support that. Um, I think that a lot of the, the learning and a lot of the skill base in palliative care comes through on-the-job training. It comes through people who have been doing it for years and years and years. Mm -hmm. um, I think that this certification is great because it does um, establish a set of standards, kind of a common knowledge base that everyone is expected to have and, and demonstrate by passing a given exam you know, in that field. That's all fine. Um, I, I, but from my perspective, I, I um, focus less on certification and more on skills you know, and experience. You know, who, what, what do you know? What, where have you worked? What have you, what have you done? How have you, how have you used this knowledge? And being a, uh, a fly on the wall of a number of our uh, cohort courses, we, ha we have about 100 online courses. Some of them are self-paced, but a number of the longer certificate courses are led by an instructor and the students are interacting with each other in this sort of virtual space. And I, I get to uh, sort of poke in every once in a while and observe the conversations. And it is, it, it is very impressive and astonishing what, what is being shared among the students, what they're learning and how they're applying. That, that knowledge. So that's just, that's my perspective on it. I used to joke when we were early in the development here in our Sacramento Roseville area, and we were very small in FTEs that I would find the moles who actually did the work naturally. And so I had a cardiologist and a neurologist, and what I have found is that there are amazing frontline nurses, especially in the hospital, who have lived their career, watched how we let people get sicker and maybe not manage the goals or manage the symptoms or manage how things are going, maybe not being completely honest with the family, having a doctor who's very uncomfortable talking the real talk, and and having somebody else on the team come forward. I was delivering, I was working with the family 15, 20 years ago, and the guy who delivers the lunch tray came in and looked at the family and said, oh, you want to listen to this one because she knows what she's talking about. <laughs> It was the guy with the lunch tray who understood what my job was way better than most of the physicians who refer to me. So I think that there is something in licensure and certification around prescription, and I would, I would very much want that level of knowledge for somebody doing intense clinical assessments trying to talk to me about a lidocaine infusion or ketamine. But as far as nice people who are compassionate and want to talk to me about what it is to be sick and what I'm hoping for, I don't need you to be certified. Those two contrasting opinions are exactly the kind of thing that would be great to evaluate uh, as things are going to generate this discontinuity in the number of people that are certified and licensed, especially in California. And it would be fantastic to be able to look at whether you know licensure is actually going to really be effective or certification is going to be effective in creating skills that you're pointing out that are often sort of more innate in, in certain kinds of people. And we have a nice opportunity for that. I'm going to take a little bit of a macro approach to that question, which is um, when I think of licensure, I'm not necessarily looking at specifically board certification. Um, but uh, I do believe that licensure overall um, plays a big part in how care models are designed and implemented. So um, one of the things that we found very early on was uh, community-based palliative care is often provided uh, as a secondary service line from hospice or a secondary service line from a home health agency. Um, the overall licensure of a hospice or a home health agency then dictates what they're able to or not do. 
um, for palliative care. And that, that actually can become problematic and um, really make a schism in the care model that is provided um, ultimately only because of the licensure limitations. So one of the things um, that uh, actually Senator Hernandez championed last year was SB 294, which changed the hospice facility licensure so that um, uh, skilled nursing could be provided to people who, uh, under a hospice license, to people who were uh, non-hospice palliative care patients. That's actually very important to the care model delivery and design. Um, I think that as we continue along this path of providing serious illness care, certification um, or credentialing is going to be uh, play a big part in how we actually identify who the quality programs are and who the not so quality programs are. Um, and right now we have uh, joint commission certification for inpatient palliative care and for community-based palliative care for home health and hospice agencies. But that's going to have to be developed out a little bit more, especially as we have more complex health systems like accountable care organizations um, or hospital-based community-based palliative care programs that actually don't have any um, certification or credentialing right now. With regard to payment models, comment in any way you, you choose about how maybe Blue Shield is looking to the future about payment models. Um, and, and kind of within that, um, at the health plan level, there, there are, I met the services that can take advantage of scalability, right? But at the end, also a very a significant part of this is done through the local provider. So can you talk about how Blue Shield thinks about about that? How we actually looked at payment for uh, palliative care is uh, the first component was that it actually needed to layer into the other alternative payment models or value-based payment models that we were already undertaking. Um, uh, Blue Shield really prides itself in uh, partnering with our uh, local health systems um, as well as community-based practices and we have across the state a number of accountable care organizations that have uh, shared risk shared savings with us we wanted to make sure that um, palliative care or the provision of palliative care did not compete with the overall um, capitation or uh, reimbursement models that we have with our accountable care organizations. And so what we did was actually take a very thoughtful approach in um, providing an alternative payment model that only covers the professional services that a, a palliative care program might provide. Um, and it fits then into the capitation um, that we have for uh, primary care services or, or facility-based services. So we had to really think about uh, overall budget, what does that look like? What do value-based payments look like at Blue Shield? What do we want as, um, as really the future or strategic plan of those overall payment models? And then fit in the alternative payment models or bundled payments like our oncology practice of the future, our oncology bundled payment, our palliative care bundled payment, and think through how we can identify patients, not double pay, Mm -hmm. but also make sure um, that people get access to the care that they need. Um, so we, we actually spent a lot of time really layering that in. Um, we did ask uh, CMS for a specific test code for home-based palliative care, um, and we were given that that test CPT code so we could track who is actually accessing home-based palliative care um, and align that code with then the overall contract agreements that we have for accountable care organizations. Okay, thank you. And Shelly, uh, Kaiser Permanente is an integrated financing and delivery system, so maybe um, how, how resource allocation decisions for your service is made within Kaiser given the integrated nature of, uh, of Kaiser. So I, I should preface this by saying that the MD on my badge stands for Major Dodo, um, and I will, answer, <laughs> I will answer what I can. So Kaiser is a health plan. It's a hospital company, and it's a medical group. It's three companies in one. Some are for-profit. Some are not for-profit. Um, as the health plan in 2006 realized the importance and the need for our members to have access to this, we mandated that all, all of our medical centers would create palliative care teams. That came as an unfunded mandate. So the medical group then had the auspice to try and figure out how you do this, or the hospitals had to figure out how do you do this. So if you look across the 22 medical centers in Northern California, the teams will look different. And in Sacramento, we are incredibly blessed that we have one of the largest teams because our local 
local leadership saw the benefit. Um, and it, it, it actually even gets much more complicated because what we have found is that if my team can get in the door with somebody who's living with a serious illness and offer them the opportunity to talk about serious illness, what it's likely to do over time, and the choices they would make when such and such happens, um, usually patients choose not to return to hospital, not to go to the ICU, not to have that next surgery or next test. That ends up saving the hospital money, but not necessarily the medical group. So we've had had lots of conversations over the last 15 years about where's the money going. Um, my approach at the end of the day is it's one bucket of money. We are in a per member, per member, per month capitation. It doesn't really matter to me. And um, what I have advised my palliative care team is do the right thing by the patient. And if you can accomplish that in one visit, accomplish that in one visit. If you need six visits to get it accomplished, take six visits and get the work accomplished. At the end of the day, my team is quote unquote done. When the patient understands what they're living with, we have a plan that matches their goals and we have the ability to implement the plan when it's time. Hi, um, I'm Ryan spielvogel a physician over at Sutter. Uh, in the vein of patient-centered, collaborative, end-of-life discussions, I wanted to bring up medical aid and dying through the End-of-Life Option Act. Um, well, assuming that that gets reinstated at some point, I kind of wanted to get your take on where that would fit in, where that fits in with future practice and policies. Um, I think it's an important conversation. I think it's it's... I have very mixed feelings about the whole thing, I'll be honest. Um, and I resist the, the idea that somehow we, we have to have this option and this law in order to stimulate good end-of-life conversations. And I, and I know that's not how it's necessarily phrased, but it's sometimes phrased as a, as a, a silver lining, a benefit, that, that by, by having this law passed, by having the conversation about the law, that that then stimulates conversations about, about the end-of-life. Um, and, and that may be true, but I think it, where I would like to see our political resources and our financial resources and our um, uh, professional will and our professional energy focused on is making sure that everyone has access to good palliative care. You know, that, that would be my preference. So that's just, just a couple of thoughts from from uh, an educator. The law did offer the, the ability to have different conversations. Uh, at Kaiser Permanente, we offered the option. And the way I see it is, um, it is an option. And so if I can have a conversation with you about what it is you're living with, what's important to you, what matters to you, and if how your death goes is really important to you, then I can have conversation about that option and whether it makes sense for you. There is some very weird, sticky stuff about the option. So even though our members are Kaiser Permanente members, many of them were paying full price for the medication, but we could offer medical financial aid. So I think that um, should the law come back, we have opportunity to continue to really think about what is it that we're trying to accomplish and what makes sense from a social perspective. Yeah, I, I, I definitely agree with that. I think, I think that it's fairly complicated and understanding the decision-making process under those circumstances bears you know, a, a, lot of, a lot of thought before trying to jump into any new programs or policy changes, and that's one of the reasons why it's been such a hard to, hard to tread territory in general. Really, we are in alignment with what Shelley said um, in that this is an option. This is an option, should it be reinstated, that is available to Californians, um, and that we want to encourage people having informed choice and informed decision making both through advanced care planning through their goals of care and if that is something that aligns with their goals of care then th that is an option for them. So uh, Dan Hofer, Chief Medical Officer, Outpatient Palliative Medicine for Sharp Healthcare. Two comments. Number one, NQF needs to add a ninth metric for palliative uh, qualifying uh, uh, qualifications and that is the professional skill of prognostication. Um, we are losing out on great opportunity because we tend to tell ourselves we can't prognosticate, thinking about um, time prognostication, not event prognostication or probability prognostication. There's three different forms. You don't need all of them. It's very profoundly guiding in how patients will respond to therapies and responses to care. The other issue is, are we doing anything on any level besides what we're doing in SHARP to partner with primary care such as uh, uh, the American Academy of Family Medicine, um, to go into their systems to educate their providers, the American Board of Internal Medicine, 
uh, working on a national level to integrate uh, palliative medicine to primary teaching. It's very interesting. I've been kicking around this field now for about 20 years, and certainly over the past 10 years, uh, one of the constant themes has been from, from the palliative care specialty side of things is we've got to get the generalist trained. It, this has to happen sooner, all of which is absolutely true. And primary care physicians and other clinicians are actually doing palliative care a you know, good amount of the time, whether they call it that or not. And there's an opportunity there to hone those skills, you know, as in prognostication, having conversations, giving patients an idea of where their illness is taking them, giving them an opportunity to make some choices earlier on, managing pain and symptoms, looking at those the contextual issues that are just not possible to, to um, take on in a hospital consult. So there's all kinds of great reasons why palliative care should be happening in primary care. And in response to that, the CSU Institute for Palliative Care created and recently launched a primary palliative care curriculum, um, essential palliative care skills for every clinician. It's 34 hours, self-paced, nine courses. Dan uh, was the author of the prognostication module. It's fabulous. And what we're discovering is that it's kind of a hard sell. Yeah, um, it's, we're, we're, we're getting it out there. People, are, people are, are getting it. But the analogy I came up with recently is that, um, you know, the, the, the old saying, preaching to the choir. This is more about like the opera telling the audience they need singing lessons. Yeah. And the audience is saying, no, we don't. You know? Or they're saying, that's why I come to see you, because I don't know how to sing, and I don't want, want to know how to sing. So we're, you know, we're, we're working on this, and I think eventually we'll, we will, there will be uptake in this, and, and the, the course will do well, and you know, other efforts in that direction will do well, but, but it really is a, it's a different cell, and it's a different um, approach you know, to, to how we do education. I would add that I think we have to look at what is the environment that our primary care docs are working under. So in a 20-minute appointment when I have 30 measures that I'm being held accountable to, am I really going to take the time? And what I find fascinating when I do a consult and I call the primary care doctor, what I get is, oh, yeah, that makes perfect sense. I, that totally is what I would have expected. And so I wonder how much is, do we add extra work to what they're already doing because they knew it, or we make charting easier so that what they know is obvious in the chart, because it, I never surprise a primary care doc. When I call them, I'm never a surprise. They, they always expect what I have to say. And so I think that it's more either help them with some kind of, of documentation that just makes it easy to say, yeah, we talked about this, and you're, to your point of prognostication, um, you can do that, and this is what will, your body will look like when it's all said and done, or you don't have to. Um, and then for the time prognostication, because people do get so wigged out about this whole idea of what prognosis is, um, I tell patients and families all the time, I will be wrong to my husband, I will, or I will never be wrong to my husband, but I'll be wrong to you, and I'm always wrong to Medicare. I never know. And as soon as I give you a date, you're going to outlive me just to prove that you can. Um, and so I'm much more concerned about how well you live, and then the timing is, is completely out of my hands. Um, and my experience is that families are way more accurate in prognostication. And so I also try and teach my families and empower them. If this is feeling weird to you or you're feeling something changing and shifting, I trust you implicitly. Please call me. But I, to your question of, of getting this out there, I, I feel like the work is happening. I, I feel like we don't know how to capture the work. From the standpoint of looking at this purely from what we can tell from the information, it's very hard to prognosticate accurately over time and over quality of life trajectories, especially when most of the research has been done looking back from death as opposed to looking forward from some particular sentinel event. And Carl and I have been looking at this for quite a while, and the uncertainty is problematic. Uh, the other piece of this that has uh, really been the passion area for some other people at the Schaefer, Schaefer Center is understanding that even if you have a reasonable prognosis, the uncertainty around that might also be contributing to your quality of life. The hope that you could be in that 1% that's the exception to the rule might actually be what keeps you in a better mental state over the course of time and the rest of, in the rest of you know, whatever remaining time you have left. And so these are really challenging things that go back to the communication and how the prognoses are framed when you're, when you're having that and the training that goes into creating the right 
psychological setting for communicating information like that. And there's a number of people that have been looking at that, but I don't think that it's made its way anywhere near into a dissemination framework. The only other thing that I would I would share about primary care provider training is uh, we have so many health systems that have become more and more complex. Um, and these are really to help offset the burden on primary care physicians. And so um, one of the things that we are uh, sort of puzzling through is how much are we expecting primary care physicians to do um, and how much we're expecting, say, a health system's case management or um, their mid-levels or medical assistants um, in having conversations with patients about serious illness. So how do you actually identify when somebody is a complex case and refer them and which ones can you take on yourself? Um, that's something that I think is actually somewhat unique to the way that health, different health systems are set up and what um, support they have around primary care physicians to offset some of that uh, burden. I was a little disappointed that there's nothing at all about pulsed in this, and you know you can have an advanced directive until you're blue in the face, but a paramedic can't follow that. And you know, pulsed is a wonderful tool, but it also, I mean, there's issues with it. And right after this, I'm going to go over and meet with some people at, at Senate Health and uh, Senate Judiciary about a bill called AB 937. I don't know if you guys are familiar with it, but essentially, this is a bill that if you sign anything saying that you want full you know, full treatment, full code, and then subsequently lose decisional capacity, it can't be changed without a court order. And I, I just, could, if I could get your comments on the importance of having actual physician orders for people who are seriously ill, and that PULST is being done for people sometimes who really are not appropriate for it. I'm all for it. We need it. Go do. <laughs> Mission accomplished. Good. That was brief. <laughs> I think that we do need to offer the ability for patients who definitely do not want things to um, have that signed and in writing and, and then trust that the order will be followed. Um, what I, I always am counseling patients and families that the post is paper, so if it gets torn up or lost, then we just revert back to care as usual and, and make sure they understand what care as usual would look like. So, uh, and final comments, uh, I too am hopeful and thank you so much for the opportunity. There also needs to be some level of interoperability and accessibility in a pulsed. Uh, that's, that's ultimately what I would say. I mean, I, I think that it's absolutely necessary to have medical order documentation. So to maybe offer some, some just brief, very brief closing comments, um, you know, as, as I listen to today, I make a couple of observations. One is um, there are a number of emerging models. The comment was made about uh, there's not one size fits all in this area like in so many others. Um, but also the observation of uh, the need for testing those models to assess what's working and what's not, um, and being careful to strike the balance on the quality uh, versus cost issue, lest we kind of lose the confidence of the, of the patients as, as all of these uh, different models, payment and, and, and delivery uh, emerge. Um, I think it's a fair comment to say that uh, California is making progress on a number of, of these issues. Um, whether it's workforce, policy decisions that we heard Jennifer talk about, programs of one type or another in research. But um, uh, to be fair, uh, we, I think we would all agree that more needs to be done, whether that's um, funding for palliative care training or um, continuing to work on clinician uh, attitudes and perspectives on this, on this question, um, disseminating evidence where that evidence exists uh, to improve care and hopefully standardizing um, certain things that um, allow us to optimize um, the, use of, the use of resources. And then finally, uh, continuing this for the research community, continuing the research to, to know what works. Um, bottom line, I think it's fair to say we're on our way, but more to do. So in wrapping up, let me just say, um, I wanna thank all of the speakers and panelists uh, today. Um, especially want to extend appreciation to the Moore Foundation, who is a very important funder of today's event. Um, uh, and they are such an important funder to so many things that are of concern and interest to those of us here in California. Uh, thank all of you for being in attendance to hopefully make this worthwhile. They're uh, worthwhile for you. Um, there will be um, some follow-up, either proceedings or an issue brief of some sort, but understandably, uh, the staff wants to have the benefit of having heard this discussion and, and will fashion more of that uh, going forward. So 
Thank you all for attending, and I wish you a good afternoon and safe travels. Thank you.